Hello, everyone. Welcome to Humulus U 2021, a digital hop symposium. I'm your host, Eric Sanarud. And whether this is your first Humulus U or you've joined us in years past, I'd like to thank you, each and every one of you, for taking the time to join us today. Innovative Strategies to Enhance Hopping is the first webinar of our Humulus U 2021 series. If you haven't seen any of the past webinars or last year's Humulus U, you can find all of those on YouTube searching for BSG Craft. They're all on our page there on YouTube. You can find all of our past webinars as well as other great content from our wonderful suppliers. So be sure to check those out. For future webinars, a link can be found on our homepage at bsgcraftbrewing.com and bsgcanada.com. So you can sign up there. We also announced them in our newsletter, the best way to learn about new products and important information. So if you haven't already signed up for a newsletter, please do so. And of course, we're all on the internets. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, where we post all the time. If you haven't signed up for the rest of this year's Humulus U for Humulus U 2021, there are three more sessions in addition to this one. You can find them on our homepage at bsgcraftbrewing.com or bsgcanada.com. Click on the link in chat right now. We'll also bring you there. And so we look forward to seeing you again. Okay, enough of that. Let's get into what we're talking about today. In today's webinar, Ashton Lewis, aka Mr. Wizard, is going to be diving into hopping techniques. And now, unfortunately, Dr. Patty Ahrens is unable to join us today as she's taking care of a sick pet. However, today we do have Ashton, and he will cover the use of dip hopping, hop creep mitigation, and biotransformation. Following Ashton's presentation, there will be a moderated Q&A. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit questions. Don't raise your hand, submit questions via Q&A. So please do that. And now, uh, Ashton, please join us. I will welcome our special guest, Ashton, Mr. Wizard Lewis. Hey, Ashton, how are you? Thank you, Eric. I am Ashton Lewis, uh, coming to you live from Springfield, Missouri, my office for the last year and a half. Um, little intro here. First of all, I need to uh, start my video. A um, little intro, I, Patty and I were going to give a talk today that was uh, kind of inspired by like a yin and yang approach. So it was going to be like the science and the practice of hopping. And unfortunately, uh, Patty's beloved dog, Bullet, broke his leg this morning and he's in the emergency room getting repaired. So I'm going to be kind of playing two roles and I'm going to start here by sharing my screen and jumping into the, uh, the first topic. So I am um, I'm kind of presenting a review of dry hop creep. And if you uh, can believe it or not, um, I am Patty Aaron for the moment. And uh, let's just jump right into here. So the first topic that we're going to be discussing today is, is dry hop creep. And our, our theme was uh, yin and yang here, where it was going to be the science and practice. And I'm going to be covering both sides of this, this uh, topic here. So a little bit of uh, literature review on the history of hop creep. You know, a lot of brewers know hop creep from recent years, but if we look back in, in history, uh, we see that the, the first mention of this topic was in 1893, and this was uh, published in, uh, in England in the Brewer's Guardian, and uh, Brown and Morris uh, noted uh, maltase activity and some dry hop cast beers. Really not much was heard about it after that initial report. They, they did demonstrate that the maltase was actually present in hops, but not a whole lot of uh, future research came out of that until we heard about it again in 1941 with uh, Janicki, Kasathane, Parker, and Walker. And again, it was the same, the same thing. The diastatic activity of hops together with a note on Maltese and hops was the title of their publication. And that was published in the uh, Journal of the Institute of Brewing. And uh, you can see here, let me get my pointer up, that Several hop varieties were looked at, uh, old Sots hops, two and a half years old, relatively uh, fresh Oregon hops, uh, six months old, uh, British Columbian hops and, and hops from England. And they all showed uh, diastatic activity in, in these samples over a relatively short time period, incubation of 10 hours. So again, you know, this was uh, some time ago, uh, 80 years ago. Didn't really hear anything about this until about uh, 2016. So. You know, why, why did this topic come up um, after so many years of dry hopping? Uh, I don't think the, the science is really clear on that. But we, what we do know is that, you know, holly hopped beers became popular with the advent and popularity of the, the New England style IPA, which came on the scene in the, the mid part of the 2010s. 
So the, the first time that we uh, really heard about this in recent years uh, was reported by two groups about the same time, um, Allagash Brewing and also Bell's Brewery documented a phenomenon in finished beers where you know fermentation persisted after packaging. And Allagash noted this uh, in particular because they had never uh, dry hopped before until 2016. So they, they produced their first dry hop beer called Hoppy Table Beer and they expected the beer to, to have a, a bottle CO2 of about 2.6 volumes. And for those of you don't, who don't know the backstory on this, Allagash bottle conditions a lot of beers and they have a lot of history and knowledge about bottle conditioning. So when they were targeting 2.6 volumes, they felt you know, quite confident they were gonna get that. But they found that this first beer actually reached four and a half volumes in a relatively short time period, four and a half weeks, and that batch was destroyed and then uh, Bell's Brewery uh, documented a similar phenomenon about the same time. So that's kind of the, the history of it. What does hop creep look like? And what, what are requ what's required for hop creep to, to occur? Well, the requirements, there's three kind of simultaneous conditions that have to be met. Um, and the three conditions are the um, uh, apparent or real extract in the beer. So that's a requirement where you have unfermentable real extract in beer. Uh, you have to have active yeast for this to occur. And then the key thing that, that makes the hop creep kind of special is that hops that are high in diastase or, or have a diastatic activity are required for this to occur. And not all hops have um, a pronounced diastatic activity. So if you look at this, uh, this graph here, this is from Kirkpatrick and Shellhammer uh, poster from 2017. There's, there's four different uh, scenarios here. We have a controlled beer, and what we're looking at is extract over time. We have a, a control beer plus hops. So there's no, there's no yeast added here. And what we're seeing is a boost of extract um, from, from the hops themselves. So hops do contain some extract. So there's a, there's a boost in the beer uh, gravity just from the hop addition. And then we have beer and yeast, no hops. There's a little bit of decline in, uh, in gravity. But the real pronounced thing here is the, the condition where we have beer with um, some dextrins, we have viable yeast, and we have hops that are diastatic. And over time, you can see that there's a reduction in extract. And there's also an increase in um, ABV, increase of alcohol, and also uh, increase in CO2. So that's kind of the, the classic hop creep. So what's the biochemistry of this? <clears throat> well, the, if we look at kiln hops uh, compared to malt, uh, kiln hops have not a whole lot of alpha and beta amylase. I mean, compared to malt, we can pretty much say that these are um, devoid of alpha and beta amylase. I mean, they're, they're not, but this is not a significant amount of enzyme compared to malt. But if we look at the, the real difference between kiln hops and kiln malted barley is that um, kiln malts don't, some kiln malts do, but normal kiln malts, don't contain um, amyloglycosidase, glucosidase, or uh, limit dextrinase. So amyloglucosidase, so-called AMG, um, is a debranching an enzyme, and it also produces glucose. Uh, AMG is uh, commonly used to, to produce light beers. And then limit dextrinase is also uh, present in kiln hops, and limit dextrinase only debranches. So what does that mean in practice? <clears throat> well, if we look at... Um, a starch molecule. This is a, a diagram or a pictorial um, depiction of amylopectin. We can see that amylopectin has one reducing end, multiple non-reducing ends, where a beta amylase can, can do its activity. Um, and then there's branch points and the amylopectin molecule. So these are alpha-1,6 branches. And in normal um, you know, mash digestion of starch, we have alpha amylase activity that randomly cleaves alpha-1,4 bonds within the molecule, so so-called endoenzyme, and then the, the exoactivity of beta amylase will come here from the non-reducing ends and cleave off maltose. And alpha amylase and beta amylase are both uh, sterically inhibited by this alpha-1,6 branch point. So th that's the key is that finished beer has these so-called limit dextrins remaining and that's where limit dextrinase and or amyloglucosidase can come in and produce fermentable sugars from uh, starches that, that 
uh, yeast normally don't have access to. So that's kind of the, the background of, of course, how this happens. There are a lot of factors that can lead into hop creep. So some of the kind of the, the farm uh, side of things, the, the varietal uh, variants does seem to affect enzymatic activity, but there's not a clear link between hop variety and, and hop creep. There's a lot of varieties that, that creep and they don't always creep. Um, harvest maturity is thought to play a role in the amount of enzymes in the hops prior to harvest, which also might have an effect on post kiln um, enzyme concentration. And then there's agricultural practices that are also thought to perhaps factor into this. Then we look at what happens after hops are harvested. We have post-harvest processing, which includes kiln temperature, but also um, you know, methods that are used to, let's say, enrich hops by removing leaf matter um, can also have an effect on, on the enzymatic activity. In fact, th those types of preparations tend to be lower in enzymes than hops that, that have all the leaf matter um, present in the, in the hop product. And then finally, it's into the brewer's hands. So we have uh, dry hopped beers, high in residual extract, tend to creep more. And that's because there's more you know, dextrins there for the enzyme to um, act upon and produce fermentables if, if the enzymes are actually present. The hop load also factors into the enzyme concentration. So if there's enzymes present, the more hops that are used, the more enzyme activity will, will be there. Um, and then there's hop timing and hop temperature or dry hop temperature. So really a lot of factors. And, and from a practical standpoint, there are too many factors to really predict if, if there's gonna be a, a hop creep problem. Again, uh, we look at some data here. This is from uh, a group from Bells, uh, Kirkendall, Mitchell and Chadwick. And at Bells, they, they termed this not hop creep, but they called it the freshening power of hops. In this case, uh, they were specifically looking at Centennial. And the interesting thing here is that if you look at the time of addition, uh, you can, here's the, a non dry hop control, um, but you see that the, the time of hops on beer has an effect on the increase in ethanol. So, what this is showing, of course, is the longer uh, the contact time, the greater the ethanol in the, in the finished beer. And then they also looked at the difference between what they're calling post harvest here. This is after um, yeast removal. Uh, cold versus warm dry hopping has an effect. So, you know, there's, there's kind of interesting effects there. Now, if you look at uh, going back to Kirkpatrick and Shawhammer's group, or, um, their poster from 2017, they're specifically here measuring uh, glucose and maltose as a function of temperature. So they were dry hopping a beer, incubating for one, two, and seven days, uh, centrifuging to remove the hops, and then measuring uh, glucose and maltose in their media. And what they're showing here is that there's an increase in both glucose and maltose over time that's dependent upon temperature, which of course makes sense because these enzymes are you know, affected by temperature just like any other enzyme. And that, that uh, kind of ties into this here where it, you know, the, uh, the temperature of the dry hopping has an effect on the, the increase of ethanol. And then one last slide here, kind of on the, the literature review um, side of the topic, shows, um, again, the, uh, the effect of contact time on glucose and maltose. This is actually a, a duplicate slide from the last one. But their, their model solution here was Coors Banquet, um, which that happens to be the, the beer that Allagash used in their original uh, research in their brewery. And they added to this beer uh, 10 uh, grams per liter of cascade hops and sodium azide to prevent uh, basically spoilage of their sample. And there's no yeast here. What they're doing is just incubating this over time and look at, looking at the, uh, the development of glucose and maltose. Now, a practical issue here, if you're a small brewery and you want to uh, reproduce this type of study to ask the question, do I have hops that may produce glucose and or maltose, their, their method of measurement here was with an HPLC. So if you don't have an HPLC in the brewery, that kind of um, you know, limits this method. But there, there are other ways to measure this, which I'll or maybe um, estimate this, which I'll discuss later. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the portion that's supposed to be Dr. Aaron. 
Um, and the conclusion of that is that hop creep happens. So now I'm, I'm the practical brewer. I don't have a different hat to put on here, but um, I wanna talk about I'm going to talk about the practical brewing side of this. And I just noticed that my camera's not running. So I'm hoping that that's not, I just noticed that uh, Eric or, or Liz, if you can yell at me, if I'm doing something wrong, please let me know. Okay, cool. So I'm going to transition here into um, the practical side of things and creep happens. So the kind of the title of my uh, portion here is balancing the science with the practical. So I'm, I'm Ashton Lewis now with BSG. So if we're thinking of a practical brewer here, what, what's the real problem or the concern with hop creep? Well, it can be a minor irritation, you know, inconsistent finished gravity and fluctuations with percent ABV uh, can be disturbing, you know, problematic. Um, the beer comes out too dry. I would consider that a, a mild irritation. It's not the end of the world, uh, but certainly if we're if we're packaging our beer and labeling percent alcohol, then yeah, you know, it's that's kind of a problem. Um, it's also a speed bump because the um, the easiest way to mitigate hop creep is to add aging time to ward off the unexpected. So the the additional aging time added to ward off the unexpected falls into the I'm not sure if I'm going to have a problem but I'm just gonna be careful and add additional time to the process. That's kind of um, maybe not the, the best way to look at it. Another way is to say, well, let's, let's set some control limits and wait until our beer clears something like a VDK a control limit analysis. So we're looking at diacetyl or um, uh, pentane dione in that case, or an alternate case there. But if we're, if we're looking at uh, clearing VDK, that's a speed bump because it's taking longer for our beer to, to get out of the cellar. So that's, that's a, a more serious irritation, but the real problem is that it can be very, very expensive, uh, reduce uh, production capacity and increase QC um, expenses can result from hop creep. And then the other really big problem is package failures in the market. So, you know, these are kind of hold the phone kind of problems. Now, if you look at the uh, reduced uh, production capacity, there are breweries that have reported about a 50% uh, reduction in capacity because of hop creep, because of they've, they've had to extend their, their lagering times uh, or their aging times to get their beers to clear uh, VDK. So it's an academic problem, but it's a, it's a real problem for practical brewers. So what are some of the things that we can do to um, you know, mitigate the problem here? One is um, reduce the dry hopping rate. Now, th this might be uh, perceived as kind of a joke. It's like, well, if you have a beer that is hopped at a certain level, you know, reducing the dry hopping rate uh, is very likely to affect the beer flavor. But the truth is that's, um, that's debatable. And there's been a fair amount of research by some larger brewers looking at kind of the, uh, the point of diminishing return on hopping rates. So reducing hopping rate can be a, a way to, um, to reduce this problem, but it's certainly not gonna make it go away. So reduced dry hopping rate is probably not, not something that's um, a great idea as far as a practical, you know, does it really work? Another idea is to dry hop early. So the thought here is that you dry hop early, and if you have creep, but because there's enzymes present in the hops, you give the enzymes plenty of time to do their thing, and then you allow the yeast to kind of finish up the process. Now, personally, I'm not a huge fan of this because what this really is doing is that it's basically admitting that you've got um, diastatic enzymes and hops, so you're going to add them early to essentially do what um, an exogenous enzyme might do, which produces a very dry beer. So if you're not interested in having a beer that's really, really dry, then this method could end up altering the, uh, the finish and the character of your beer. So even though it's effective at maybe uh, reducing the VDK uh, rest period at the end of fermentation, it doesn't really address the root cause of the problem. And neither does dry hopping late. So some people say, well, I'm, I don't want to dry hop early and have all this unwanted enzyme activity, so I'm going to dry hop late. Now, if you do that, that can work except the problem with the hop creep is that you've got enzymes, yeast, 
and fermentable extract or um, extract that can be turned into fermentables in the package. So if you dry hop late and do something like pasteurize your beer, then that can be a very um, good solution. But if you simply dry hop late, that's not gonna necessarily prevent the problem unless you dry hop late and get your beer very cold and keep it cold, which uh, packaging breweries have a hard time doing, but that's certainly uh, an idea for uh, you know, pub breweries and tap room breweries. So this kind of falls into that same idea as dry hop cold beer. That, that is a solution that can work. Um, this is kind of a joke here, only dry hop brutes, not exactly a um, great idea there. And curmudgeon the cat is asking seriously, why don't you just suggest not dry hopping at all? And of course that is the, uh, the final suggestion here is simply not to dry hop. None of those are satisfactory. So let's look at some real things here that, that a practical brewer can do to address these issues. Now, one method that um, many brewers are using and the brewers who use this know that it works is the, the um, use of the exogenous enzyme alpha acetolactate decarboxylase. So if you look at kind of the, the science behind what's going on here, uh, if we look at yeast during normal metabolism, if there's valine in the media, valine in the wort, yeast will take up sugar, but they're not gonna, they're not gonna take up valine first because the, the first thing the yeast will do is synthesize valine inside of the cell. And as yeast are synthesizing valine, alpha acetolactate is um, pushed out of the cell. So this is kind of like a, a roadblock. There's some alpha acetolactate that's uh, produced and excreted from the cell uh, during uh, valine synthesis. And over time, the alpha acetolactate accumulates outside of the yeast cell. Now in normal, so what we see here is the, we've got an increase here in alpha acetolactate and then diacetyl. So the, really what we're looking at here is diacetyl in the beer. And we get to a peak as the um, alpha acetolactate is converted outside of the cell to diacetyl. So this is a relatively slow conversion rate um, unless you like heat the beer up or, or oxidize, which of course that's not a great idea, but this is a slow reaction. And then once the yeast start to reabsorb the diacetyl, we typically see a decline in diacetyl levels. Now with the enzyme alpha acetolactate, the levels of diacetyl really never build up to a very high level because what alpha acetolactate does is convert um, the precursor alpha acetolactate um, into acetoin. So that happens outside of the cell. Here's the chemistry, alpha acetolactate and alpha acetolactate decarboxylase takes the CO2 molecule off of this alpha acetolactate and produces acetoin and CO2. So, you know, normally for uh, within the yeast cell itself, if diacetyl is reabsorbed and reduced, we typically get a uh, two, three, butane, so this is four carbons, butane, diol, so two OHs, and acetone is one ketone group and one OH, but this has a low threshold of detection, and that's how alpha acetyl decarboxylase works. Now, this slide here shows kind of a normal lager fermentation, or let's say an ale fermentation where we're concerned with diacetyl levels, but this really, this, this uh, enzyme is used a lot for lager beers, and it reduces the time of aging. Now, if we apply this to uh, dry hop beers, what this little uh, star is showing is when, when the enzyme is added. So if we add it, do I have the right slide? If we add it to our dry hop beer, you can look at the, the diacetyl levels. There's again, a small rise and then it falls. And compared to the control where we dry hop and we see a relatively large increase and diacetyl and then a, a decrease. And what's happening here is that when we dry hop, there's, um, again, there's a spike in sugar from the, uh, the dextrins in the beer and we get, we get the um, excretion of alpha acetolactate, which goes on to turn into diacetyl. This is the real problem because late in the cycle like this, late in fermentation, the yeast tend to be uh, lower in concentration and this reduction time can be prolonged and very, very expensive. So that's the alpha acetolactate decarboxylase story. Um, 
And we know that, that brewers that are using ALDC have a, um, they, can, they can resume kind of normal operations. Another idea, and this is, um, I'm really not sure how widely used this is, but if we look at the food processing industry and look at vegetable blanching, you know, vegetables are, are uh, blanched a couple different ways. One is with steam, another is just, you know, drop it in hot water and then cool it down. And the purpose of vegetable blanching is to denature enzymes before further processing. So, if, you know, frozen vegetables or, or even if you're cooking vegetables, if you do a short blanch before you cook them, you can preserve, you know, uh, color and texture and flavor. And we can do the same thing with hops. So with, with hops, um, if, if we're going to try to denature these enzymes, it looks like about 60 degrees Celsius is kind of the minimum of temperature required to denature the, um, the limit dextrinase and the amyloglucosidase. But we don't want to get too hot because if we get hot, we're going to start to isomerize alpha. So the goal here with blanching is to denature enzymes and to minimize the isomerization of alpha into isoalpha. Now, there's actually a precedent for this. Um, and I don't know that, uh, that Martin Schmezel was the first uh, person to do this, but uh, this gentleman is a hop farmer in Germany and had the idea back in about 2015 to, uh, to process fresh hops to stabilize them. So he essentially, has a, a patented process that's very, very similar to blanching. And his wet, these are completely wet hops. They're, uh, they're milled, unkilled uh, hops that are, they're heat packet, they're put into a package and heated. So they're, um, they're, they're processed very much like vegetables as far as blanching goes. These are samples here in what looks like a tuna can, but uh, he also uh, packages hops in foil packets. So pretty cool um, process here. And then in 2020, there was a group um, that presented a paper last year at the, the CBC that was online, and Kaylin Vaughn was part of that group. Um, and Kaylin Vaughn's um, part of a brewery in Australia, and they reported using uh, pasteurization to denature hop enzymes in packaged beer and found that one PU, one pasteurization unit, you know, was sufficient to denature hop enzymes in beer and to prevent a hop creep. When they, when they first started playing with their, their pasteurizer, uh, they started out with really high uh, PU levels. Uh, I think 25 was the, the starting point. And over time, they, they decreased the uh, thermal exposure and settled on uh, the number of one pasteurization unit being sufficient to destroy the enzymes. So th those are kind of interesting methods. Now, if we look at, um, you know, let, let's say we're in a, a small brewery and we want to do something like this. Well, one idea is um, to put hot pellets in a tank. Uh, not everybody has a, you know, agitated tank like this, but let's just say you've got some kind of vessel that you can put hops into and either pump hot wort. And when I say hot, you know, we can cool this down to 80C or, you know, 60 to 80C through a heat exchanger, or we could even use water. But let's just say we're going to use um, hot wort and bring that hot wort into this tank, do a um, hot blanching process. And then once we start our, our knockout to the fermenter, we can then pump that in line. So that's, that's a practical way of, of denaturing hops before use. This is not you know, a whole lot different than a, you know, adding uh, hops to a whirlpool where the wort's already been cooled down to some degree, which is a you know, popular process these days. Now, the same thing could be done at the end of the process too. We could, you know, we could still, uh, if we have a, a tank like this, let's forget about the fact that we have a whirlpool in this drawing. If we had a tank uh, to add hops and hot water to, uh, we could simply pump that, that heated slurry into beer, um, either, you know, midway during fermentation or, or at the end of fermentation, of course, accounting for the, you know, the temperature, the, the warm hops coming into here. But we can certainly, you know, heat process our hops um, in the cellar, just like um, we would in the brew house. So um, one thought here is to, instead of, um, you know, reacting to a problem, is to look at hops before they're brought into the brewery. So let's say you're, um, you're bringing in hops, and the question is, will the hops 
result in hopcrete. Well, an easy method that, that a, a small brewery can use is to use the same method that Allagash used when they first identified Crete back in 2016. And you know what they did, I don't want to oversimplify it, but you know, they simply took um, you know, a Coors Banquet beer, so readily available beer uh, that has you know some uh, residual extract in the form of dextrins in it, and they added um, yeast and hops to beer and they, they measured the effect over time. So if you have, let's say in this case, this is a control, but let's say you have um, hops that don't creep. Well, over time you could have beer, hops and yeast and you would expect to see no change over time. But if you have hops that, are, uh, that have enzymes, then you're gonna see a reduction in extract um, over the course of this um, experimental period. And with the Allagash data shown on the slide, they were, they were doing this with three different yeasts, and you can see that, that all of their yeast tested, their house uh, yeast, uh, a trappish yeast, and Chico, uh, they all experienced, they all demonstrated a reduction in, in extract over time. So th this is a, a pretty simple method you could use in any brewery. And then if you have an HPLC, then of course you can use uh, the method from Shellhammer's lab where they're you know, incubating uh, beer with hops in the presence of sodium azide and they're not looking for a change in extract over time they're they're measuring the uh the change in uh fermentables so here's a here's a bar graph and what what they actually at a bar chart here they they decided to just look at the increase in fermentables and not these these dextrins over time so you can see uh one here that's the degrees of polymerization this is glucose and maltose, and what they're showing is an increase in, in maltose over time and an increase in glucose. And then you also can see that the, the dextrins are reducing in size. So your maltotriose and uh, your, your you know, four carbon or your four glucose and five glucose polymers are decreasing in time, which shows the, the activity of these enzymes. Okay, so that's um, that concludes the hop creep segment on this. This is balancing the science with the practical, and the message here is to keep on hopping. You know, nobody wants to uh, stop making great hoppy beers because of hop creep, but the uh, the take home message is that there are ways of mitigating this problem. So look forward to discussing this after after the next segment. So with that, I'm going to take a I'm going to have to stop sharing my screen here for a moment and pull up a, um, a different presentation. So give me one moment while I do that, please. Hi everyone, I'll jump in here as Ashton swaps over. Yeah, so up next, we're gonna be talking about dip hopping and biotransformation. And I just wanna remind you, some of you found it, uh, Q&A is below at the bottom of your screen. Get your questions in there and we'll be able to answer those when Q&A section comes up after these next two short presentations, right around 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, so about 25 minutes. Uh, I happen to personally be very excited for the dip hopping section of this presentation. Uh, dip hopping is some a newer, unique-ish technique for introducing hops to beer that, in my experience and working with some brewers on it, really can um, you know, change the game a little bit, change the expression hops a little bit. And so we'll let Ashton get fully into that when he's ready. And then of course, biotransformation, the word that we all know, the word that is too long to say, so we like to say bio T, but uh, that's going to be a great one too. <laughs> Tim, thank you for dropping your question in. I'll save that one. And uh, Chase, I also got your question. We'll save those ones for uh, Q and A when Ashton's more available. But here he is. So I'm going to leave and Ashton's going to talk. Thanks, Ashton. Thank you. OK, I've switched to Keynote. So um, if anybody uses Apple products and has an iPad, this is about the coolest thing that I think I've found in a long time for presentations. So I'm going to be talking about what's the skinny on dip hopping. And um, I guess I'll give the, the background here in, in a moment, but um, if we look at the evolution of dip hopping, 
it's like Eric said, this is a newish topic. And if we look back at the beginning, the, the first time that this method was mentioned was in 2012. And it was, um, it was developed by the uh, Kieran's uh, Spring Valley Brewery in Japan. And they were looking for a, a way of boosting pleasant hop aromas in beer while suppressing all flavors. Can't really find much about how they came up with this idea. My, my theory is that they, they tried it and it, it worked and then they developed an explanation to describe what they were, what they were seeing. But this was in 2012, didn't make a whole lot of um, you know, splash about it. But then uh, Van Havoc and Ben Love, which gigantic brewery, were in Japan, and they they literally the story is they just stopped by Spring Valley to check it out, and they were really struck by a beer called Four Nine Six India Pale Lager, and uh, they started you know asking what was going on because the the hop character was really interesting, and the Kieran the Spring Valley brewers told them about this method that they had described as dip hopping. Um, now, if you're really into numerical trivia, you got to look up uh, what 496 is all about. It's considered a perfect number, and the math is way beyond my comprehension of mathematical theory, but uh, somebody at Kieran is a math geek, and that's where that, that beer name comes from. So Van and Ben get back to the States, and they start talking about this great beer they had in Japan, and it's kind of spreading around through the ether. And um, that's kind of where it, it sat for a while. We, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell the story of how I got introduced to this in a moment, but um, didn't hear much about it. Then in 2018, this was at the, um, the, uh, the Brewing uh, Summit that was in San Diego, the joint ASBC and Master Brewers meeting. Uh, Kieran uh, presented a poster presentation about dip popping. And I've, I've pulled some of the data from their presentation to, to kind of uh, share today through the grapevine, if you will. Um, that was in 2018, and again, didn't really hear much about it, at least I didn't, and um, my other life in beer is working for Brewer Own Magazine, so I've been with BYO for going on 27 years now, and, um, and I'm their technical editor, so I read all these articles, and I, I read an article written by John Hall, who's a, you know, a beer writer, and he's talking about this dip hobby, and it was, um, it was specific to uh, some beers that were brewed uh, by Gigantic and by um, uh, brewers in, um, in, Min in Minnesota, Fair State, and a collaboration between Fair State and Arbiter. And um, I'm like, what the heck is this dip hopping um, method? And I, you know, maybe I live in a, under a rock or something, but I hadn't heard about it. And um, I, I consider myself kind of tuned into what's going on. So now, uh, recently, you know, Breeder Own published this article and now home brewers are reading more about it and consumers are getting hip to dip popped beers. So it's kind of cool. So what is dip popping? Well, hops are added to the fermenter before fermentation begins. So really not a whole lot different than dry hopping except we're adding the hops early in the, in the process. That may not sound very exciting, but um, there's some cool stuff going on. So that's what it is, why? Well, my thought on this is that it fell into the why not category. You know, if we add hops late in the process, well, let's add them early on and see what happens. Um, but what they found out and what's been published is that dip hopping accelerates fermentation and it also produces beers with distinctly different hop characters than conventional dry hopping. And I'll re revisit that in a second. And how was it done? Well, the curing process and, you know, Kieran, like a lot of you know, big breweries, they like technology. And their process was to make a slurry um, after the work cooler and before the fermenter that was pumped in line during fermenter fill. So that's, that's the method that they describe. Now, oh, I know why this slide is here. Um, Patty was gonna talk about biotransformation and I, I haven't sprung this on Eric yet, but um, I decided that, um, Biotransformation is kind of like playing a Rachmaninoff uh, piano piece, and I'm not a pianist, and if I were, I sure as hell couldn't play Rachmaninoff. So suffice to say, with dip hopping, we do get biotransformation going on, and 
the the thing about uh, what I'm showing here is that what Patty was going to talk about is all of this cool chemistry, and I am I'm not a chemist and I cannot uh, do her justice. So I'm instead of uh, butchering what she was going to present, what I'm going to say is that that all of this chemistry shown on this um, in this diagram, and there's a lot more chemistry than what's on this one diagram can really be translated into uh, pictorial terms. So if we look at geraniol, for example, well, we can look at the molecule and say, well, okay, that's a terpene and it's got an OH group on it. And yeah, we can, we can talk about that or we can go over and look at, well, what does it actually smell like? And this is uh, one of our colleagues at BSG, Mike Brennan uh, produced this really, really cool diagram. And what we're showing, what Mike is showing here is that these different um, you know, compounds, so we can look at uh, linalool, for example, go over here and, and see that it's got you know, four characters. Uh, you know, we, can, we can trace the, the chemical names, which are big and uh, kind of confusing at times, to more normal terms like you know, flowers, or, or in this case, uh, citrus characters. But all this relates back to what we're putting in our beer and a lot of what we're putting in the beer in the way of hops are these hot terpene compounds. So if we're, if we're dip hopping or, or dry hopping, the, the different terpenes from the hops are being added to the beer. Now, this is where the, uh, the topic of, of biotransformation gets pretty deep. And the, the question becomes, if we're selecting hops for for dry hopping, what characteristics do we want to look for? And you know, one one thing that's being commonly done now is to look at the terpene profiles. So in this case, all of these hops tend to be rich in geraniol, versus hops over here that tend to be rich in in linalool fragment fractions. So I'm just going to say that uh, that the Dr. Aaron's topic on biotransformation is a deep one. It's something that uh, that we'll revisit, but one of the take home features here is that if you're looking for specific characteristics from your hops you're adding during fermentation or, or late in fermentation, the, the real question is how do yeast convert terpenes or so-called aglycones, terpenes that are, that are bound to a, a carbohydrate, how, how do yeast act upon these to form uh, special aromas. So that, that really is the question. And I'm, I'm going to punt on that today. So suffice to say, biotransformation happens. Okay, so let's go back to dip hopping. So this is the kind of the, the class, let's say call this the classic description that um, uh, the Kieran uh, published. And if this looks familiar from my last presentation, it is because I, I specifically wanted to show that the idea of dip hopping can be used to, to blanch hops. So in this particular diagram, uh, we are showing this special mix tank that's required. And this is, this is from the, the Kieran paper. And what they were doing uh, specifically at Spring Valley is using water to hydrate their hops and then pump that, that solution into the lime. So here we have, oops. Here we have a, a slurry of hops and water. That's what we're showing here. And that's being pumped into the beer line. Now, one question that, um, that Kieran asked, and I, there's, a, there's data from their uh, poster paper that I don't have related to this, but they asked the question, uh, does this method result in hop creep? And what they did in their study is that they, they looked at uh, 90 degrees Celsius water versus ambient water. And they asked the question, well, if, if hop creep is going to happen, we're going to see a difference in our final gravity of beer that's been um, hopped, dip top with ambient water treated hops versus 90 C water. And in the Kieran paper, they uh, in the Kieran uh, study, they found that that 90 C water made no difference compared to the ambient water. Now, 
to me, that doesn't show that the dip hopping has any effect on hop creep. It just shows that maybe the hops that they used were not um, high enough to cause any problems. So this is kind of the classic method that I've uh, shown here on this particular slide of how um, Kieran developed dip hopping. But there are definitely uh, some variations on the theme. One theme is, is pretty darn similar to the original, but it's to use wort instead of water. So the, the problem with water is that you have you know, to calculate your diluent and you have to boost your, uh, your wort original gravity to account for your water addition. So what I've shown here, I don't have any valves on my diagram, but you can see that the idea here is to pump wort uh, from the whirlpool through a wort cooler. Oops, I hit the undo button. Uh, pump through the wort cooler and then into this hot mix tank. And then we can, we can add our hops to the mix tank and do it like that. And this wort can be either hot, let's say 80 degrees Celsius, or it can be cool, maybe 20 C. And the decision on your temperature here may be uh, related to the hops you're using. Let's say you know you have hops that, that have the uh, propensity to cause hop creep, then you can dip hop with hot water for hot work. Or if you're not worried about hop creep or actually maybe want to encourage it for a drier beer, then you can use a uh, cool work. So that's the dip hopping method as described by Kieran. Now, U.S. brewers that don't have, you know, this, this special mix tank that I had drawn here is, you know, I've taken that out of the equation. So what I'm showing here is um, a fermenter that we've added. Get my pen back. Oops. A fermenter that we've added hops to. So we've added hops to the cone of it. And then we're going to bring in water, so this, we've got water source over here, and we're going to pump through our cleaned and sanitized uh, transfer line, and we're going to put water into our into our tank. Oops. I also show over here that we have um, the addition of CO2. So some brewers are adding a CO2 blanket to that tank when it's filled. So that the hops are under CO2, because there's a thought that um, the oxygen could cause some flavor issues. So this is one variation on dip hopping. And then when the uh, when it's time to knock out our whirlpool to the work cooler, then we just simply fill our work into the tank and away we go. Okay, so that's how that's how dip hopping is done. It doesn't sound that exciting, but let's look at some of the measurable effects of this method. One, one key measurable effect is a accelerated attenuation. And if we look at the, um, the rate of fermentation of, um, of beer, so this is our, our time factor here. So we've got days to attenuation. So the blue line is without the popping. I'm having technical difficulties here with my pen. There we go. The, the blue is without that popping. Oh, I can't draw on that picture. And then the red is with. So you can see that with the popping, we we got to uh, final attenuation a little bit faster than than without. And if we look at the effect of of charcoal on on the rate of fermentation, it's similar to using activated carbon charcoal. So what we're seeing here is the the particles of the hops are um, acting as a way of accelerating fermentation to some degree. But what's more interesting here is the, uh, the peak cell density is higher. So without dip hopping, we have a lower cell density in fermentation, which is shown on this graph here. Um, so we have a lower peak cell density without dip hopping compared to with dip hopping. And again, if we compare that to um, activated carbon, uh, the activated carbon sample was actually higher. And that's activated uh, carbon is used by, by some uh, fermenters, like in the wine industry, there's some uh, wine-like products that are accelerated fermentation using activated carbon. So th the particles are, are accelerating the fermentation. Again, you know, is that really a big difference? That's not a flavor difference. Probably argue that that's not that exciting unto itself. But now if we look at 
uh, flavor effects. And this is really, really interesting here. So let's look at uh, linalool. I, I can't draw on this particular, oh, I can, I just had the wrong pin color. If you look at linalool here with, this is dip hopping and dry hopping, we have similar levels of linalool between the dry and the, uh, and the dip. And then late hopping, this is in the whirlpool uh, or a kettle, lower levels of linalool. So this, you know, linalool is volatile and it flashes out. Now, if you look at myrcene, and myrcene is not, even though, you know, hops have a nice hoppy character and myrcene is associated with that nice hoppy character, myrcene can lead to some problems. So let's just look at the, the levels of myrcene here for a second. You can see in, in uh, dry hopping, we have the highest myrcene levels, and in dip and late, uh, the myrcene levels are quite low. Late, basically none, dip, very, very low. So what's the problem with myrcene? Well, it depends on what kind of beer you're brewing, but myrcene is known to be an earthy, um, pungent, and let's, I'm gonna use the word dank here, uh, aroma. So not all brewers love these aromas, not all consumers like these aromas. And if we get rid of myrcene, then we have a cleaner hop finish than if we have a lot of myrcene from our, our late hops either dip or dry. So with the dip hop, we have very low levels of mercy in the finished beer. Now, the other thing that's interesting here is there's a reduction in this compound called tumor capta 3-methyl-1-butanol or 2M3NB. And this is an onion-like aroma. So you can see here on this graph here, the, the um, amount of uh, 2M3NB in the beer without dip popping is higher than with dip popping. So what's going on with this particular aroma compound? Well, the, um, the explanation of how this is formed is there's a precursor in hops that's known as EMB or 2,3-epoxy-3-methyl-butanol. And when this reacts with H2S, you get the formation of 2M3MB. So what does H2S have to do with dip hopping? Well, there's a kind of a untested, there's a hypothesis here that needs to have more research done on it. But the idea is that there's less H2O in the beer because of CO2 scrubbing. And where is that CO2 scrubbing coming from? Well, it's coming from these effects here. So the, the fact that you've got a greater amount of these small particles from dip hopping, the, the hot particles, and they're acting like, they're kind of acting like activated carbon. The idea here is that you get scrubbing of a volatile H2S that leaves the beer and it's not present to react with the precursor that forms the 2M3MB. So that's, that's pretty cool stuff. So the takeaway thoughts on, on this topic of dip hopping is that dip hopping is a newish method. It's not, you know, 2012, it didn't just occur yesterday, but for a long time, you know, most brewers really, at least in my world, didn't know about it. So now we're starting to hear more about it. It's cool, it works. It's not just a fun name. So if you use this method, there are some key differences um, in the finished beers. They tend to be, you get the kind of the fruity uh, tropical characters or whatever hops you're using, those kind of characteristics from the hops without the kind of the, the oniony dank characters that that other uh, dry hop beers might have. So it's a it's a newish method which is good for the consumer that's always looking for that new shiny object. It's not just a fun name and here to me is the real selling point behind this is that there's no new equipment required to do this. You know you can do this at home, you can do it in a small brewery, you don't need to have any special equipment at all. It's just a new method that uh, definitely is kind of worth trying. So we're here, um, Humulus U is about sharing ideas and thoughts. Um, and this is, you know, Eric, thank you for bringing this up. But this is a, this is a really, really cool uh, brewing method that I am really excited to try out my own. So that's, um, that's Patty and I's presentation. Um, we were supposed to be, a team here, yin and yang, but um, wish Patty all the best with her uh, little sweet dog bullet and hope that he comes to a full recovery. 
So with that, I want to open up the, uh, the floor for some spirited Q&A. So let's see if I can get my screen off here. And go ahead and turn on your, your camera. And uh, Ashton is correct. It's time for Q&A. Thank you, Ashton. And we have a handful of questions, so I'll be working through those and feeding those to you, Ashton. So let's um, let's stick with dip hopping. I got a, quite a few questions on that. Okay. Um, Michael, if you could toss yours in the technically in the Q&A, that'd be really great, but I'll grab it. Um, William, this presentation will be available later. Every presentation from Human Listu 2021 is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. So you can check it out later there. Um, let's go with uh, Eric Walter. Eric says, why not throw hops in a bag? That's one dip hop method. I think I had to read between some lines here, Eric. Well, my thought on, on throwing hops into a bag is that you can certainly do that. You know, that um, you can do that for, I'm going to say at home, that's, you know, that's where typically that's done. You can, you can certainly uh, hop in bags in a, in a commercial brewery as well. Now, with the dip hopping, though, one of the one of the theories with how it works is that it, the um, the hot particles are nucleation sites for gas release. So if your hops are in a bag, then you're not going to have the um, the nucleation sites. And you know, part of the the theory behind that is that the increased um, amount of particulates in the beer scrub the H2S out. So I'm not saying that you can't do it, but you you might not have the same effects if you restrain the hops in a bag. All right, similar question, or a couple of questions along these lines is, is basically what rate, pounds per barrel, is a good starting point for dip hopping? And then how does dip hopping interact with potential yeast harvest? Those are great questions. Well, I think the hopping rate is, uh, <laughs> the sky is the limit. Um, but the, you know, the rates that, that I've read that are being used are anywhere from you know, one, one pound per barrel up um, but I think that's that's really a personal thing of of hopping rates that are you know much above let's say two three pounds per barrel. It kind of gets into the the point of diminishing return. Now, as far as yeast cropping that goes, um, you know the the hot pellets are going to come out of solution. They're, they're going to fall down to the bottom of the fermenter and they're going to mix in with your yeast. So I, I think that with any um, dry hopping method that's used, and I'm going to I'm going to lump dip hopping in with dry hopping. You know hops that are added to the fermenter. I think brewers need to be very, very careful about cropping yeast and reusing it because the, you know, the cell walls do get kind of uh, mucked up with, um, with compounds that, that can interfere with, um, you know, the, the ability to reuse the yeast effectively. All right. I also will uh, just back up on what I know from some brewers who have trialed uh, dip hopping is, as far as rate goes. Um, they are, they, the most interesting thing I've heard is, is they, one brewer specifically felt that for the dip hop beer that he made, he put it in a dip hop edition and then his regular dry hop edition. And he felt like he should have reduced his dry hop edition with the dip to the same amount as the dip hop. So he was transitioning. So let's say it was going to be three pounds per barrel dry hop. If you put in a pound of barrel, uh, dip hop, he took one, he would take one pound out of the dry hop. So I don't know if that helps any at all, but another kind of piece of color as you explore this. Um, another question about exploration that, you know, Ashton, I'm interested if you found a straight up answer here, but dip hopping, what is the residence time before you should knock out onto the hops in the tank? That's a good question. The, um, the original information, what I read from Kieran, the time was not, was not terribly long. And the main reason, again, American brewers always change things. You know, we're, we're all about experimentation. But the, the original idea, if you will, is to hydrate the hops into a slurry and pump them into the, into the, the work stream. And the idea is not to use you know, hot water or a solvent to extract anything from the hop. It's simply to get the hops in solution. Now, I know, I know a lot of American brewers that have tried dip hopping they are using hot water and they're making a hot tea and, you know, maybe, you know, waiting an hour or two before, uh, before pumping that into the work stream. Um, but from what I've read from the Kieran work, there was really no uh, particular whole time that was uh, cited. Let's see, we've got, uh, 
hold on. A lot of great questions. Thank you all very much. Um, Eric Harding asked, when creating your slurry to be fed in, is there a preference for, for water over wort? And I believe you kind of touched on that a little bit, but do you want to reiterate when dip popping? Well, for me, in the pre when you say preference, that, that's a personal, you know, that's an opinion. My opinion, I, I'd rather use water than wort because, you know, if you calculate your, if you know how much liquid you're going to add, it's, it's easy to calculate your dilution. And for me, it's just a cleaner method to use water versus wort in the cellar, unless you have specific equipment that you can, you can use. And especially if you're adding, let's say you're adding the hops to the Conover fermenter and you want to get your hop solution uh, prepared before knockout. Well, in order to do that, you'd have to, you know, start knockout with wort and you'd have to wait some time and resume. So I, I think from just the smooth brewing process, it's a lot easier with water. Now I can say if I were doing this at home, I would probably do it with wort at home because it's a whole lot easier to deal with small volumes of wort in a homebrew system than it is in a commercial brewery. But if I were, you know, my former life, um, I worked for an equipment company for 20 years and we actually designed a lot of different hop dosing systems for breweries. Some were uh, used water and the, the hop dosing systems that we designed that were based on water were used by brewers that had a high gravity component of uh, adjustment in their cellar. And then other breweries had basically the same equipment and they were using uh, beer as their solvent um, or, you know, media to mix up the hops. So I, I think your, your question says, what's your preference? I think it really depends on how your cellar is set up. To that point, uh, Thomas asks, uh, they say that they're making a uh, 20p density beer on Thursday, thinking of partially dip popping it after this conversation. So, hey, I mean, if you do it, let us know, man. Uh, but what a high gravity impact in any way, he wants to know. They want to know. I don't, I'm, I'm sitting here kind of thinking through the, the explanation, the chemistry. I don't, I don't think that high gravity would have a positive or a negative uh, difference. I, I, I mean, it, it's going to work. The, the question is, how is it, how is the hop character going to be expressed in the beer? But my thought on this, if you're going to dip hop and you already do dry hopping, I would tend to like, you know, you know, jump, jump in the pool fully. Don't just dip your toe into it, you know, go use enough hops. So you can say, yeah, this really, you know, if, if you're hopping, let's say two to three pounds of barrel in the cellar and you want to do dip hopping, go, go big and say, does this, you know, is it really a different kind of character? Um, if your if your batch size permits something like that. I will, I'll add one, another anecdote about dip hopping. Uh, there was a question in here and I'm sorry that I'm, I've lost track of who asked it, but basically, oh, Bob, it might be similar to your question. Bob asked, rather than mixing the hops with water in the tank, can you just knock out onto them and get the same results? I'll say that one brewer who I know who's trialed and played around with dip hopping did more or less that. What, what, what he did was shift his whirlpool hops to be dip hops and eliminated his whirlpool hops. And now those are, you know, we're, we're changing a lot of things there because we've got temperature and we've got agitation, but um, that is something that people have done. Yeah, I, I'm kind of embarrassed because I was drawing like these different uh, strategies on like variations on a theme. And that's, that's, uh, that's probably the, the easiest way to, to try the variation on the theme. Okay, we've got a couple questions about cleanliness with regards to dip popping. Um, they're not exactly the same, but I'll read them both. So from Michael, Michael asks, is there a bacterial contamination, enteric question mark parentheses? I don't know what that means, you probably do. Concern with adding hops to wort before pH drop and alcohol formation. And similarly, perhaps, is if just using water to dip pop, do you have any concerns with regards to cleanliness of the water? Do you need to boil and sterilize or anything like that? Well, those are interesting questions. I can tell you that this is just a coincidence that the dip hop comes from Japan, but way back when, and uh, it was 1998, I was in Japan and uh, with my old job and we had, we had just started a brewery that I worked for for a long time. And we had a beer that went bad and it was enteric and oh my God, that's the nastiest, nastiest kind of bacterial spoilage. And in our case, it was um, 
it was a problem with our SOP for work, work uh, chiller clean out. We, we had literally just started brewing and um, we're kind of learning some things about our piping. But anyhow, I would definitely, uh, I think that's a great question because hops do contain, uh, you know, obviously bacteria and yeast. And there's, you know, been studies that look at the, the fate of those microorganisms in beer and they don't survive very long at all. So any, any bacteria or yeast that comes in on hops, if you, if you dry hop beer and you look for those organisms after dry hopping, they, you can't really, normally they're not found. You know, they're, they're not found in beer, but we're not adding hops to beer now, we're adding it to wort. So I think your, your question's spot on. And um, I haven't seen any data on that, but certainly the method of, um, I'm gonna call it hop blanching is an easy way to address that. So if you, you know, blanching destroys enzymes, it also destroys, you know, bacteria. So if you're adding um, your dip hops to hot water or hot work prior to injecting into the work stream, that's, that's probably a, a good way of uh, being safe. Now, your question about water, I think you need to, you need to treat your water as brewing water. You know, it's, it's ingredient water and whether you're using hot water or cold water, it ought to be, uh, you know, your brewing liquor. And if you're using ambient brewing liquor, it should be heat treated before you cool it down. Um, to the point of, you know, kind of hot uh, uh, chemistry, you know, infection or like kind of what it's bringing outside of what they bring outside of what we want. Um, Tim asked, any thoughts about sous vide hops prior to dry hopping or I suppose also dip hopping? Well, the sous vide hops are really um, in the first presentation. I can't remember what I was talking about. Hop creep. The uh, the the like, citation like I gave the, from yeah yeah the year ago. The the uh, citation from Martin Schmeisel from Germany. That's that's essentially what that method. I mean, I don't want to say he's he's using the sous vide method, but it's very very similar to you know to sous vide and. Just to be a, a food geek, you know, sous vide technically means under vacuum. So if you're if you're using a hot water circulator, that's just you know hot water. This the sous vide is under vacuum, and the the advantage of under vacuum for any kind of process is that removing the air is removing insulation. And if you if you process hops that are devoid of air, you're going to have better heat transfer be, between your liquid and the the hops. But certainly if you if you did that. Uh, you you could you could effectively uh, blanch your product, but again with um, with the the thermal stability of enzymes and bacteria, you know things tend to be especially microorganisms tend to be more stable in a dry environment than they do a wet environment. And then the other thought on that is if you if you did use a sous vide method, you would definitely want to regulate your temperature in such a way that you're not having um, isomerization of your alpha. Uh, we're sticking along these lines. Uh, these have been great questions also, everyone. So keep them coming. I'm working through them. We're going to try to connect dots and, and, and weave a beautiful tapestry. Um, Keith asks, uh, how long will you blanch before transferring on top of it? Which is similar to the idea before. And this is one of the number one question that people, the number one question is water or wort, right? And then the second question is how long um, for, for dip if you look at if you look at the, um, now the data that, um, or the, the information I presented from um, uh, Keelan Vaughn in Australia, he said at their brewery that they were, they required one PU. So one PU is, as I'm probably gonna get correct on this, but 60 Celsius for a minute. Um, they, they were needed one PU to uh, basically deactivate the enzymes in beer. But the thing about PUs or thermal exposure in general is that the amount of thermal exposure, it's a logarithmic function. So it's like a thermal death curve. The more, the higher the enzyme concentration to begin with, the more uh, thermal exposure required. But if you're using, let's say you're using water that's, you know, 80 degrees Celsius, you're, it's just like when you're pasteurizing milk, you know, your whole time for, for typical milk is seconds when you're high temperature, short time pasteurizing. So if you're, if you're hot processing or blanching, if you will, hops with water that's somewhere between 70 and 80 degrees Celsius, by the time you're done with your process and you're, you're pumping out, you've, you've probably spent more time 
getting ready to pump out than, than you need for the actual thermal kill. So that's a long way of saying that it, it doesn't take very long and whatever you do in practice is probably gonna be a lot longer than you really need. Also on dip hopping, any study about the influence on bitterness units and the dip hop process? Well, the interesting thing about dip hopping, if you Google it, there's very, very little out there, which is kind of cool because it's, you know, first documented in 2012, there's not a lot of research on it. Uh, what I did read and, you know, all the, all the data really comes from Kieran, the method is designed not to produce bitterness. So that's, that's the reason that in their method, they're using um, ambient water. They're not using hot water. So in that particular method, you wouldn't have any, and I'm going to call this HPLC bitterness. You're not going to see an increase in isoalpha alpha acids if you're simply steeping hops, but you can get oxidized hop compounds that do lead to bitterness. And then of course, if you're using like the UV method, of uh, measuring IBU, you're, you're going to get an IBU increase with the method, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bitter. Now, the, the other reference that I gave to uh, Martin Schmeisel in Germany, his hop uh, method, they actually publish on their, their certificate of analysis of their product, um, iso alpha acids in addition to alpha acids, because in that thermal process, they are isomerizing a little bit. And most of the hops that I've seen out of that farm are probably about one to one and a half percent iso alpha. So it, I hate to say it, it depends on how you do your process. Uh, another question that may depend and is maybe in the eye of the uh, beer brewer, but uh, anonymous attendee asks, do you think there's much difference between dip hopping and dry hopping, something like 24 hours into fermentation? Well, if the, if the idea is, I would say no. I mean, honestly, I, I would think no. But the, the idea about the H2S, though, is interesting because um, a lot of those uh, the sulfur compounds are created, you know, as soon as metabolism starts, you get, you get the formation of flavor active compounds. So if the, if the H2S theory is, is correct, or if that plays a role in it, then then there might be a difference. I think the key thing though is back to the question, why did, why did Kieran do this originally? And, and I was kind of joking around, you know, because it's there, you know, it's something to try. But I can tell you from my former life in equipment that a lot of the methods that are used for dry hopping are really, really uh, difficult. Um, some of them are flat out dangerous. I mean, people love, love to post stuff on social media, but the number of uh, dangerous dry hopping um, endeavors that I've seen are really unbelievable. So dip hopping, if you think about it, is it's an easy and safe way of adding hops to your work stream because it's, you know, it's down at ground level. You're not crawling on top of the tank that's, uh, you know, got beer in it. Um, so to your question, you know, adding, adding hops really in fermentation are probably pretty similar. Got a question here from someone named John Carroll, who you might know. John asks, uh, how much of the aroma is lost through the blow-off arm when dip hopping? Are there ways to prevent that? I don't know John Carroll, but I know somebody by that name. <laughs> I don't know, John. We, we, need to do, uh, we need to do a little bit of dippy, dippy hops ourselves, but I don't, I don't think the uh, retention of aroma with this method is going to be... I'm trying to think about the chemistry. I don't, I don't think the retention of the aroma is going to be any worse or better than, than uh, normal dry hopping. Now, of course, there is a difference, though, with uh, the loss of mercine. So if you go back and say, well, why does the mercine disappear? Well, it's because it's more volatile. And that's why that's getting blown out with the dip hopping. And it's, it's not uh, dropping off with the traditional dry hop. And then the little, little retention... Um, is interesting. So I think that your your loss of aroma is going to be different. Um, the question is, what are you retaining, and how does the retained aroma balance with what you're losing? A handful of more questions here. We're going to wrap up questions by two thirty. So if you have questions that you want to ask, make sure you grab them, get them in there. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit from dip hopping. 
Um, so more of a kind of a resource question, but it's from Chase and Chase asks, do you have any sources or links for the studies on diminishing return of dry hopping rates? I think the places that, that Chase or anyone else could go to find those, those papers. I know who, I knew who I have talked to the most about this and it's an individual and I don't know that the, the information is public. Um, and I have not, I'm trying to remember if I've actually seen good data on this, that's, um, that's public, but I, I can tell you that the diminishing return is somewhere around two and a half pounds per barrel total is what, and I've, I've heard that, I mean, this is totally anecdotal, you know, take it for what it's worth, just call it a rumor. But I've, I've heard through the professional rumor mill that about two and a half pounds per barrel, you, you start to see a, a reduced um, sensory um, perception on that. And the breweries that I know that have studied this spend a lot of money on dry hopping. And what they've basically done is they've looked at, you know, they vary their dry hopping rate and they've done sensory studies and asked the question, you know, if you're looking at um, like the intensity of the perception of hop aromas, where does that, where do your scores start to flatten out? And the, you know, the interesting thing is, is that depending on how your dry hops are added, you can, you can get a much, much higher sensory scores simply by changing your, your method. And one method that, one study that I know for certain uh, that was done was dry hopping in glass containers. And when I say glass containers, what, what one, one group was looking at is what happens to hops when you add them to, to beer. And because you can't see that in a fermenter, you know, you, I say you, but you know, brewers add hops to fermenters that are stainless steel and there's no way to really know what's going on. It turns out that a lot of dry hops simply float on top of the beer and never actually make it into the beer. And those hops are, they're, you're adding them, you know, to your process, but they're not actually getting into the, the product. So it's, it's kind of unfair to say that you're dry hopping at three pounds per barrel of if a lot of that material is simply floating on top of the tank. And then in a similar fashion, you can, you can add hops to, to beer, pelletized hops, and they're so dense, they fall right to the bottom of the fermenter and they never dissolve. So it's the same thing. They're just on the bottom of the tank. And then even this is public. Um, Sierra Nevada has talked about this in the past where they, you know, they still use the method of um, giant hot bags for celebration and I believe Bigfoot. You know, but they put uh, cone hops in these giant, they're like giant tea bags that are in the beer. And they found like dry pockets of hops, you know, after like a week in a tank. So I think that the, the key with uh, increasing your hop utilization for, for dry hopping oftentimes is simply, you know, getting the hops to be in the beer. Now, this is kind of a sales pitch, but at BSG, we, we do regulate, we control our pellet density specifically to address those concerns because the pellet density that we use is kind of a, it's not exactly neutrally buoyant, but the, the hops will fall into the, to the beer tank and then dissolve so that they're not, you know, they're not sinking like a rock and they're not floating on top of the, the beer. So long story short, somewhere between two to three pounds per barrel is what I've heard is kind of that point of diminishing return. I, uh, on the point of uh, hop density, maybe that's something we can explore at the uh, Tech Talk next Humilicio or maybe a webinar in between. It's very interesting. A um, couple of folks chimed in with their kind of uh, sources or where they feel like they've seen that two and a half, two, three pound number. Uh, Brian says it was either in the hot book by Hieronymus or in Wolf's thesis, W-O-L-F-E. And David says, Scott left, Scott, La Fontaine did his master's, his PhD on it as well. So there's a couple names to look around for if you're looking for kind of more of a source on that. Thank you. Now, uh, let's talk about, there's more questions about water and dip hopping here. So uh, de-aerated, de-oxygenated water, and then also water chemistry. Is it, you know, do we think about this in similar ways we think about is it brewing water? So do we want to screw with the chloride sulfate ratios to try to produce different, you know, experiences in the final product? Two questions about water. 
I think the the water, I think that the most important thing about the water is that it's, uh, you've got, you know, your chlorine has been removed, obviously. So it needs to be, you know, brewing water, it needs to be clean water. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about deaerating the water per se, because you're going to add, you know, you're, you're aerating your work. And you if you're adding, you know, hops, sorry, to aerate at work, there's no reason to, to deaerate the water. Um, there is an argument, though, about, you know, the oxygen, the hops. So I think um, there could be an argument for limiting the time of hydration uh, before use, although I don't have any data that, that supports that thought. And then the other thing about your, your minerals in your water, I would argue that you're not adding a lot of water in, in the form of the hops. And I would, I would focus my minerals in the brew house where, again, it, they're easier to add. You know, if you're adding uh, brewing salts to ambient water or hops or, you know, you're going to have to have a mixer. And with, with the, the easy dip hopping methods, you don't need any extra equipment. But I think the, the more that you start doing with them, um, the, the more, um, you know, equipment and, and process you're going to have to have. That's just an opinion. Yeah. Just a couple more questions and we have a couple more minutes. If you have any burning last minute questions, let us know, get them in the chat, get them in the uh, Q&A section. Um, I wanna go, uh, given the antimicrobial properties of hops, this is from Chase, should you bump up the initial yeast cell count with a thought that a large dip hop popping rate may kill off some yeast? I would tend to say no. I, I don't know that I've never read anything about um, hops being having any antimycotic effects, you know, that are, you know, disruptive to yeast cells. You know, there's certainly, you know, hops or lactobacillus don't like hops, which is a good thing. But I, I wouldn't think that you would, I, I, I don't, I've never seen anything about the effect of high hopping rates on cell viability or vitality. Couple of similar style questions here. One from Thomas, one from Kevin. Um, basically, how important is that we hydrate the hops? Is that so that they're not just sitting there? What if we just knocked out into hops that are already in the tank? Knock out through the through the hops in the tank. Yeah, and that question had kind of been asked before. I think that'll work well. Um, but the problem with uh, I think the reason again back to Kieran, you know, why do why do breweries do what they do? A lot of it is just ease of use. So if your if your objective is to um, introduce hops into a work stream during tank filling, the most efficient way to do that is to make a slurry. And then the other argument on that, and this, if you've if anybody's ever heard the talk from a David Capral about um, uh, stratified fermentations, it's absolutely fascinating. But there's no question at all that when you're adding, uh, you know, work to the bottom of a fermenter you know, your, your velocity is so, so low. It just kind of, you know, it just kind of spills into the tank like a gentle, you know, underground spring that's emerging. And there's, there's not a whole lot of mixing. So the velocity essentially kind of almost stops as the tank is filled. So you're not gonna get very effective mixing if you simply, if you did not hydrate. So I, I would say that the reason to hydrate is process efficiency and ease of use. Awesome. Well, that wraps up our questions and our time today. So thank you all very much. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Ashton, could you please repeat the name of the talk regarding the stratified fermentations? The author's name is David Capral, K-A-P-R-A-L. And he's a retired brewmaster from Anheuser Bush, who was the uh, brewmaster of the Baldwinsville Brewery. And he lives in... Uh, I think he lives in Boise, Idaho now, but he was kind of like a Johnny Appleseed there for a while talking about these topics because he got so excited about it that he just, he, he wanted to spread the word. But what he found when he was at Baldwinsville is that when they were filling tanks with multiple brews and a single fermenter, that they were literally, it was like two different fermenters in one. They, they would have the top of the tank would be fermenting at a different timeline than the bottom because it, you know, they were filling over about 18 hour period. And the top of the tank was at a different gravity than the bottom. I mean, they were literally separated. And then at a point in time where the densities would get to the point, they call it flipping, the entire tank would flip. 
And the way they figured this out is that their, their gravity results that they were collecting in the lab were just crazy. And, um, but what he, what David really got on the, the soapbox about is that a lot of smaller breweries, you know, that have, you know, multi-fill tanks are not mixing their work when the tanks are filled. So look, look that up. He's, I think he's written several articles in Master Brewers about that. And right. before you cut me off, Eric, I just want to say yep. thank, thank everybody uh, out there for participating. And thank you for no um, biochemical questions about uh, biotransformation. So hopefully I was good at like, uh, like passing that ball to, to Patty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will, uh, I will reiterate that. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I want to let you know if you have further questions, you can email us at info at bsgcraft.com. And again, all the past webinars, as well as these and the future webinars from Humulus U21 will be posted on our BSG Craft page on YouTube. That'll, that Those links and acknowledgement and announcements will go out via our newsletter, our social media channels. You can also ask your customer sales rep. They'll be able to help you get access to those. Uh, also, thank you, Ashton and Dr. Ahrens for making this such a great talk. Finally, last, but not certainly least, certainly not least, from all of us here at BSG Hops, thank you all for your support tuning in here and on YouTube. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you all. Cheers. Bye.